What's beautiful and has been really liberating to me is like, I love business because it lets me live my life the way I want to live it. I love marketing and stuff like that, but it's only like the vehicle to help me get closer to my dreams. Hey, my name is Jenna Kutcher and I am obsessed with all things business, marketing numbers, and helping you to navigate both the messy and the magical seasons of this thing called life. I'm a small town mama who took a $300 camera, grew a successful photo biz, and now I work from home and run a seven figure online business. I teach you the tried and true secrets to building a career you adore. Shy away from the real talk? (laughs) No way. Money, hardship, growth, loss, and marketing are all topics we discuss here. Think of this as your one-stop shop for happy hour with a gal pal mixed with business school. Pull up a seat, make sure you're cozy, and get ready to be challenged and encouraged while you learn. This is the Gold Digger Podcast. Let's be honest, there's nothing like a good long kitchen chat with a good friend, right? Tea is hot, the shoes are off, the hair is messy, and the phones are in the other room. The most perfectly necessary friendship chat. Picture this exact setting as I pulled up a cozy seat at Katrina Scott's table for her podcast, Live Beautifully. And I've got to say, we truly did live a beautiful moment together in this conversation. So much so that I asked her if I could bring this episode of hers over here for you. She said yes, and here we are. Now, before I press play on this episode that she shared with me, I want to make sure you link arms with Katrina and her show. It is one of those soul-nourishing shows that you're going to be so excited to listen to every week that it pops up into the timeline of your favorite podcast app. Go on and search it up, give it a follow, and have kitchen time with Katrina every single week. Now, grab your tea, pull up a seat with us as we talk about journeying through life's biggest, often harrowing transitions from motherhood to entrepreneurship to authorship to watching all of those titles collide into an entirely new kind of life worth living. Are you ready? Here is my interview from Live Beautifully. Do I have a new podcast recommendation for you? If you like the Gold Digger podcast, you'll love tuning into Content is Profit, hosted by Luis and Fonzi Camejo, brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network. Discover the secrets and strategies on how your business can achieve the frictionless sale. Luis and Fonzi dig into frameworks, strategies, tactics, and feature special guests to bring you all the information you need in order to turn your content into profit. They tackle topics like five things that you should do to grow your podcast and how to leverage trends to generate attention and answer questions like, what does it mean to stand out in the marketplace? How can you rise above the noise and help others with your offers? If you need a new show to add to your lineup, listen to Content is Profit wherever you get your podcasts. Guess who's in my house? This is such a treat. Honestly, though, I felt like I was coming home because they just like come into your bedroom and like jump on the bed and just connect. Yep. Use your bathroom. I know. Use your deodorant. And the last time <laughs> you, knew, you knew where my deodorant was and I didn't. <laughs> it's true. It really is so nice. So you have been you've been here for many times, but I love that when you come in here, you're like, what are you doing? What's happening? And uh, I always remember when I was like, I'm building my own website. <laughs> and you were like, the you can't F- do you that are. by yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, why? <laughs> why would you do that to yourself? Oh. And I'm such a DIY person. Yes. I want to know. I desperately want freedom for me is knowing how to do something myself. Yes. It's not having someone else do something for me. It's like, I want to know. There's beauty in that. Yeah. When I was first building Live Beautifully and then you introduced me to Jen and she has tonic. And so we're just going to do a shout out for her because like, I feel like the three of us will eventually do something really fun. We'll take over the world. But for real, when we were talking about your website, like you have this vision and this is your plug for tonic. What is your URL? Livebeautifully.com slash tonic. Yeah. And you, you were telling me what the vision was. And I was like, oh, I can already visualize it because they have these amazing templates. And I think what's super fascinating. And actually there's a chapter in my book about the first time that I learned how to ask for help when it came to business, Mm -hmm. because you can white knuckle things for so long, Mm -hmm. but there comes a time in your life, whether it is tragedy or loss or gain or change where you're like, I can't white knuckle anything anymore. And that's where things like tonic come into play where it's like, I have this vision, but somebody's already kind of gotten it going. So let me just finish it off. And you love the creative, which I love about you. You love the creative. Thanks. 
you're good at it too. Thanks. (laughs) I think that there's so much to that. And I feel like we could probably do, we need to do another episode all about like branding and business and everything. But I think that a lot of times we want to do everything ourselves. So that way we are learning it, but we can really ask for help and we can find other people, you know, who have gone through it or gone through similar experiences and ask for help. And it's so hard for women, I think, to ask for help. Mm -hmm. We're so proud in a way. I was thinking literally as we were driving in today that which your husband came to pick me up from the airport. I'm like, why would anyone want to come to LAX? But <laughs> he was so excited I to pick you up. <laughs> I was thinking about how we connected and it was because I was having to get induced with Coco. So literally like three and a half years ago is when we first connected. And one of my followers was like, you should reach out to Kat. She went through this and it's crazy now to just think of like our lives three and a half years later. Yeah. But also how much a difference is made when you know someone else's story and how beautiful it is of an invitation of like, okay, now I can live my own and know that I'm not alone. And so it's crazy. Like even something as, you know, different as saying I was induced with Bella Mm -hmm. connected you to me, which, you know, birthed this beautiful relationship, but it's, crazy because I think we like to keep so many parts of ourselves hidden. And, you know, you have been so public with what you guys have gone through in recent years. I was just going to say that is that it's crazy. We went through secondary Mm -hmm. uh, infertility. Mm -hmm. I was at your house when you had your third positive pregnancy test that that day. It's just annoying. Yeah. That (laughs) one was a frustrating one. um, As in it wasn't a yeah. positive pregnancy test. Oh my gosh. I forgot that I yeah. landed. We were together in Arizona mm-hmm. and I was like, I'm pregnant, but then I got my period, mm-hmm. which then I didn't know what a chemical pregnancy was, Yep. which for anyone listening, it's where you take a positive test and it's such a tease, but then you still get your period. So it's very early. It's yeah. like the, you know, that I don't, I don't know. If the HCG embryo, like, starts to pump, yeah. but it's not enough to actually connect the yeah. two and sustain it. It's like a tease. Yeah. And it's, it's the worst. Oh my God. I didn't, I didn't cry at first. I was just like, wait, what? Mm-hmm. So there was no attachment, but I was more like, okay, yeah. third time's a charm. I need help. Yeah. But yeah. You, whether I was a resource for you for, you know, your induction, I ended up coming back to you and being like, oh my gosh, we're going through our first miscarriage, mm-hmm. the second miscarriage. So I went back to your old posts. Mm-hmm. I was like, I don't want to bother her today. I got to read what she was writing about it. Isn't it crazy? I actually just got my facial and the nurse at the place that I was getting my facial was like, we were just small talking. And I said something about like, okay, now that I'm done with children, I like want to do all the things. And then we brought up the point and she goes, I have to thank you because I struggled with infertility Mm -hmm. and I went to your resources and I did all these things. And and she had just welcomed in a daughter and just how saying that one person's voice, it was a reminder that our stories matter. Cause I think a lot of times we don't, my mom will always say to me, like, you don't recognize the ripple effect of your work. Like if we're fortunate, fortunate enough, we get to like get the waves of it. Like someone will tell us that it matters, which isn't why we do it in the first place. But so often we forget like the ripple effect. Like it is literally generational. Like you sharing your stories is influencing the fact that like another generation likely can exist because people see your stories and are inspired by them. Kind of crazy. My mom and I didn't know that we had miscarriages in our family. My mom did not experience miscarriages Mm -hmm. until I shared my story. And then more women from my own family Mm -hmm. shared Mm -hmm. that had never shared before. Crazy. And so, and and even my grandmother, which we never knew either. Yeah. And so, yes, your stories matter. I know sometimes when I'm writing, I'm like, how can I really, really share how I am? And so we're going to get right into it. Mm -hmm. How are you really? Mm. Great question. (laughs) Great title to a book. Oh my gosh. (laughs) Um, Funny story about the title too. I was pregnant, super, super, super pregnant. And it was like the last stages of the manuscript and we did not have a title. And I was about to name Quinn, who I didn't know Mm -hmm. if she was a girl or a boy. So that was, I'm terrible at naming things. My first course was the Jenna Kutcher course. Like I can't name things. Uh I love it. And when it came to the book, it was like, I kept describing it to people and I was like trying to get people to help me name it. And I was like, it's like when you get past the, like, how are you good, busy? And like you lean in and you like feel safe. So I am feeling all the things I think you and I were laughing because 
both of us just transitioned our toddlers into big girl beds. On the same night. So on the same night without knowing it. So weird. We were both like yeah. two nights ago. Two nights ago. We said before, I wish we were recording when that happened. Oh, um, so weird. It's so crazy. We so, literally put the, yeah. our girls in big girl beds. Well, and it's just ago. so many transitions right yeah. now. And I feel yeah. like this stage is beautiful and overwhelming and exciting and exhausting and it's all of those things and I've been leaning more into that like dichotomy of like both existing and all those feelings existing and I think I've just been hitting this point because when I wrote the book I was like the only way I'm going to do this is if I do it in alignment with my values and if I do it in a way that doesn't like take over my life or burn me out because I've watched a lot of authors where you spend so much time writing the book that when it comes time to get it out into the world, they like go so hard that they're just so burnt out. And I was like, the mission of this book is to not do that. So I have to do this and release it in a way that feels in alignment. But I feel like even as things are starting to get busier, I just feel so pulled. And I feel like I'm constantly being like, am I doing the right thing? Am I spending my time in the right place? You know, like, I don't know. It's just, the mental load of motherhood is heavy. And I think I'm feeling it heavy. Yeah. I saw this thing this morning where it was this woman talking about how when her friends that were moms were like, oh, it's tough. Yeah. She's like, well, you know, this is how human race replicates yeah. itself. Like yeah. how hard could it be? Yeah. And then she was like, and it's really hard. <laughs> it is. And it is. And I can't believe we do it. Yeah. And no matter like if you have help, you have your parents in town, like whatever it is, it is heavy mm -hmm. because even right now mm -hmm. you are a mom. Mm -hmm. We were here. literally just like laughing at our moments because <laughs> it's like, you're never not thinking about like this schedule or are they fed or do they feel loved or are they like mm -hmm. the mental, like it's just like, I didn't even know, like I'm so impressed with what our bodies do during pregnancy, but I didn't even know my mind could expand to handle the mental load of it. It's so crazy. Isn't it crazy. How yeah. are you? Really good. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> oh. well, I'll talk about me another time. But I am nearing the end of this pregnancy, yeah, which is wild and so crazy. I look to you and other women who have their second. I think I'm looking forward to being more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, with number two, you are because I know what to expect. Yes, I have not prepared anything, like not a hospital bag, yep. not the nursery, <laughs> anything. In a terrible way, but at least I know, you know, we could go to the hospital and I could literally, you literally just, need diapers. Yeah. Like I <laughs> truly, <laughs> we brought a suitcase the first time around. This time we'd be like, Oh, I'll just grab some slippers. Bring your own blanket. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. a Bluetooth speaker. You know, what? I feel like those are yeah. the things I need music. Yeah. Yeah. I need music. Yeah. The first time I brought fluffy slippers mm. and I peed on them during oh. labor. So I'm going to bring two pairs. <laughs> I was I, so sad. Isn't that I, funny? I was going through contraction. Oh, it was so intense. Yeah. And I was standing on the side of the bed <laughs> pre-epidural. Yeah. This was many hours into when I should have had it already. And I was like, weird moment at yeah. Cedars staring at the Hollywood sign. I'm like, where am I? I'm a little girl from New Hampshire. Why am I looking at the Hollywood sign? Or no? As I'm giving birth. Yeah, as I'm giving birth. And I was going through the worst contraction. And I peed on my slippers and I started crying. I was like, my slippers. <laughs> I almost <laughs> cried this time around because I forgot my shampoo poo and stuff oh. and that first shower yeah. post birth is like yeah. a miracle in and of itself <laughs> and I was like I have to use like the hospital great like the <laughs> sterile you know like where you just feel icky and I was yeah. like okay clearly these hormones are hitting because yeah. herbal essence would do really good right now. you're fine <laughs> herbal essence uh, PR at least. yeah <laughs> 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 oh, it is um, funny though because I'm so excited to watch you. <laughs> you guys need to. I mean, like, we need to air all of this, the whole thing. I know. Which, by the way, I'm not mentioning brand. This is not a sponsored podcast, but we're talking about sponsorship where we're so oh. grateful that we can do what we love because we're great partners. So yeah. I was like, we just got to get all the us. things we use in real life. <laughs> no, I know. Okay, so back to your book because. I know for a while you're like, I'm not going to write a book. What made you actually say, I'm going to change my mind? Because yeah. we're, we're allowed to change our minds. Yeah. And I've been changing my mind a, a lot. lot. 
especially becoming a mom. I'm yeah. like, oh, oh yeah. What I was prioritizing before, I'm like, my mind is completely different. Or the vision that like your children is going to eat like all like organic <sighs> and non-GMO food. That remind me, which um, by the way, if anyone's listening that's an expert of like how to feed your toddler, would you like to be a guest? Yes. Yes. Kids <laughs> yeah. Eat in Color is a great yeah. account. If you're we'll, listening. Get, we'll get a hold. Yeah. So I have changed my mind so much. And one of the things that I think I've embraced with age and wisdom, especially to, I think, becoming a mom is embracing the evolution of like our identities. And I think a lot of times we get so pigeonholed in a title or what we're known for or things. And for so long too, I looked at my time in a different way. And I think motherhood also shifted this for me personally, but I always said I would never write a book because I'm like, why in God's name would you spend like two years of your life working on this project You really don't make a lot of money. I could just like make a course and put it out there and launch it and like do all these things, which is what I have been doing and which has been amazing. However, when I took all the money off the table, I like really felt called to. And Jamie Kern Lima, I remember one time she told me about her process writing her book, Believe It. And she was like, once I like got the idea and was in, like the words poured out of me. And I was like, "Mm, that sounds lovely, but like, that's not how creativity works. And I felt like once I committed to it, which is a hilarious story that's in the book about how I went and got a massage and came home saying, I need to write a book. But once I really committed to it, it's like the most worthy endeavor I've ever done. And it's so weird because even now I'm like working so hard and like thinking through like, how do we get this book into people's hands? And so once I like committed to the idea of it, it had nothing to do with money. So I actually wrote the entire manuscript before I had an agent, a book deal, nothing, because Mm -hmm. I wanted to write words that tell, not words that sell. And the minute that money was brought in, I knew my creativity would be gone. I knew that I would like be on a deadline that would make me feel like anxious. So I did the whole thing backwards intentionally and didn't even tell anyone I was doing it. Cause I was like, if I'm doing it for praise, wrong idea. Mm -hmm. If I'm doing it for money again, wrong idea. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's like, yeah, it's crazy. Cause I'll catch myself and I'm like, I am working so hard on this project that I just want to make a difference. And it feels good because I think for entrepreneurs a lot, it's like, you're focused on like key performance indicators and numbers Mm -hmm. and all these things. And it's like, when you let all that Mm -hmm. go, like, where do you land? And like writing was where I landed and it was crazy. I love that so much. Really seeing back and saying, why am I doing this? Yes. And we do, we do get in our own heads too. As soon as we do share what we want to do, a lot of times that voice, even from someone that you really care about of like, oh, I didn't picture you doing that. Mm -hmm. It's like, is everyone going to think that? Yeah. Sometimes it's their own limiting beliefs. All the time. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Not sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, I've gotten in my head too about identity. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, cause you know, I'll get one comment that's like, you should stick to doing squats. I'm like, oh, okay. (laughs) But what if I really love doing this? Say that. No, there's a lot. Oh my Lord. I know. It is, but it is crazy. Cause it's like this idea of identity. And here's the thing is like, When people say like you have changed, like a lot of times we take that as like a negative, like in my book, Mm -hmm. there's this line about like when we used to sign yearbooks and it was like, never change. And then it was like, no, as I've grown and evolved, like if I were to sign somebody's yearbook today, I would say like, I can't wait to see who you become. Like, I hope you change. And it's like this realization of like, we often are so resistant to change because it's uncertain and unknown. But like, look at what we've all survived these last few years on top of like the regular life struggles. We've all lived through uncertain and unknown and we've come out. So why are we so resistant to change just because we don't know exactly how it's going to unfold? And so, yeah, I've been embracing identity. And I think that a lot of us are like really on the precipice of these identity shifts and we just don't know where to go. You know, I mean, you're experiencing massive identity shifts Mm -hmm. and it's a lot and it's easy to be like, who am I? You know Mm -hmm. what I mean? Totally. I'm like, (laughs) I'm going to be a mom of two. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I can't wait. What was your yearbook quote? (laughs) Oh, golly. I think it was like a, like, oh no. Uh, Like God... God put the pen in your hand, write a good story or something. Actually, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I should look it up. Funny story about my yearbook. Writing your book. I know. (laughs) Or you wrote your book. I have this like (laughs) 
chest that my aunt and uncle gave me years ago for like a present and I put all my yearbooks in it and I shut the chest and it locked and nobody has a key so it is a literal time capsule <laughs> so when I get them out someday they're gonna smell like mothballs but it's gonna be like a really great treat Coco's I was like what's inside of here and I'm like I honestly no don't even remember <laughs> I need to be there we need to have like a I'm bottle revealing. of wine and do it my quote I don't know who said yeah, what was it I, so I forget you'll maybe you'll know the artist if you get the chance to sit it out or dance I hope you dance who's saying that I hope you dance <laughs> who's saying that dance. saying that I don't know some we need a fact check over Lazy. here Lazy. <laughs> Google oh. Leanne Rhymes no uh, Shania Twain no those are country singers <laughs> but Leanne Womack oh Leanne see I was like close You're with close. like the, the Leanne, Leanne thing oh my gosh and when you get the choice to sit it out or dance. dance. I, I hope you dance. dance. <laughs> oh, Lord, um, help us. But it's true. Yeah, it is true. I think we can wrap it up there. <laughs> <laughs> Get out there, write the book. <laughs> Do the thing. Grab that pen and dance. <laughs> okay, so, and then you split your book up into three parts. Yes. Talk to me about that because I think when people, whether someone's listening and they want to write a book. Yeah. Or they want to sit down and read your book yeah. and absorb all of it for all the help or both. How did you even sit down and say, this is how I'm going to structure it? Or yeah. did you, did you do that after you started writing? It was kind of, so what's interesting, speaking of identity is when I wrote the manuscript by myself with no one knowing, I wrote a business book. Mm-hmm. Isn't that hilarious? Mm-hmm. So I assumed, you know, I run the Gold Digger podcast. It's business podcast. I'm known in the business space. I speak on the business stages And my agent, Margaret Riley King, read the whole manuscript and she was like, I love this, but we're going to pull out the chapters about life because that's what I need. And then when Mm. we pitched it, it was still kind of a business book, but every editor I spoke to was like, this isn't a business book. So it's super fascinating because I had to pull out so much of the business stuff. And what's beautiful and has been really liberating to me is like, I love business because it lets me live my life the way I want to live it. I love marketing and stuff like that, but it's only like the vehicle to help me get closer to my dreams. So when we broke it up into three sections, part one is who are you really? And I feel like right now, as we're walking out of all of these uncertain times and kind of figuring out like, what is my new normal? What do I want it to be? We have to get quiet with ourselves and it is the hardest and scariest thing because for so many of us, we used to always say like, when life slows down, I'll fill in the blank. Well, life slowed down. Were you who you thought you were going to be? Like, were you who you said you would be? And I used to hate when I did yoga, I hated Shavasana, like laying down at the end. Same. I used to hate it. it. Now I feel like I'd be like, can I just do an hour long Shavasana? (laughs) Exactly. I like was so uncomfortable with being still. Mm -hmm. I felt like I had to earn it. I felt like I like couldn't be alone with my thoughts. It was like the idea of like meditating was like torture to me. And so the first part is just who are you really? The second part is all about community because I feel like so many of us women are walking around feeling broken Mm -hmm. and feeling like we are the only people that don't have deep relationships that don't have like the 2 a.m. friends that you can call and know they'd come over. We feel like we don't have mentors in our lives. We don't, you know, know how to be led by a former generation and we don't know how to lead the next one. So the next part is who you have and who has you. And then the last part is what are you going to do about it? Because the book itself is like, and I say this with as much love in my heart is like, there are so many gurus out there and there's so many people that look to people like you and I, but like, we are all on this journey Mm -hmm. and someone else's directions to life might not lead you to where you want to go. And so it's like, how do we get quiet enough with ourselves to like hear what our own truth is and start moving forward in the way that like only we can. And like what you're going to do about it isn't like, here's your five-step process to happiness. It's like, no, how are you going to get to a place where like success doesn't just look good, but it feels good. Like where you can stop faking that you're enjoying your life. And I, I think that those three parts are critical because we have to start with ourselves. Then we have to build the right people around us and then we have to take action. And there's so much knowledge out there. Like there's no shortage of knowledge, but like actionable knowledge is really hard to come by. Did you ever have a mentor? 
I've had a lot of mentors, Mm -hmm. but it's funny to like my mom, like, so like my mom is just the most incredible human being on planet earth. And it's been super fascinating being a mom now. Don't you look at your mom differently now? Like you're like, I'm like, how'd you do this? Yeah. And you're like, how did I turn out okay? And like, what is the secret? And how did you survive this? I want to be like, were you okay when I drove the car away from the house for the first time? Yeah. Or like, how do you sleep when you don't know if I'm alive or not in a gutter in college? Like how? I can't believe she let me go to college. Like, what? She should have rented out the dorm room next to me. mom you should have been there uh yeah to like make sure we got home okay yeah i mean all those things literally was talking to Lacey this morning about going to bars in college when you first turned 21 or when you're not 21 yet and you have an id that says you are 21 i was not that cool but i i can't believe yeah like and then now it's a different time where i I don't think that things have gotten worse you just see more of it with like news and online but yeah, yeah i look at my mom and i can't believe what she was able to do. Yeah. And she ran, she was a full-time mom, but still had, she ran her business. I think like all moms are full-time moms. Yes. Like you, like, like I said, you are a mom right now. Yes. You were just pumping before we came up here (laughs) and every mom's journey looks different. Mm -hmm. And it's really tough if you're home all day. It's really tough if you're at the office and it's really hard. Everyone's walking around feeling guilty. Everyone. Everyone. Yeah. That's what's so crazy to me. But it's like, you know, when I look at different mentors in our lives, it's fascinating too, because in the business world, a lot of my mentors are men. And so I have to like separate the emotional, like it's weird because I just think about like the emotional side is now is welcome or like I have to introduce and you understand this as well, but it's like, you know, you're sitting at a boardroom and you're like, I've got to go pump or like my baby needs to come on this work trip or things like that. And it's interesting in the business world because a lot of my peers in the industry are men. And I think a lot of females sometimes can get stuck in that like scarcity mindset. So it can create a very interesting you know, environment. But I always go into mentorship with like my eyes wide open and with this idea of like, take what serves me and let the rest go. And if there's something that like I will be thinking about before I fall asleep, that's probably an indicator that's the right advice or something for me. And if I've already forgotten about it, or if I have to revisit a notepad to look at it, it's probably not meant for me. So that's been helpful. But yeah, I mean, mentorship comes in so many forms. Even somebody listening to this podcast, this is mentorship. Mm-hmm. And I think it's beautiful that we live in an era. I'm like, Drew, I've been sending him all these like parenting accounts with like toddler stuff because I'm like, I started doing oh, We need right help. Now. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Literally our like DMs are just like, here's how to say this to a toddler in a way that creates boundaries. I but, can't believe how aligned oh, we are on so many things. Oh my gosh. From, like, not being able to meditate back whenever and now we're like give us a piece of quiet all my dms to brian are like look at this parenting advice and then he'll send me this back like a hilarious thing from like our child. Barstool yes, Sports. I'm like, I just said, like, one this I'm like, I don't want to see your junk bowl movie. It's funny. Oh, um, but like, <laughs> it's so good. It's October. And you know what that means? It means sweaters and pumpkin spice lattes. And it also probably means that you're in the final stretch of your fiscal year. And in this interesting economic climate, you're also probably thinking about how to best optimize things like budgets, strategies, and operations in 2023. But let's be honest, no one wants the best probable solution to deal with whatever comes next. You want the best solution, period. Whatever stage your business is in, HubSpot CRM platform is ready to scale with you at the flip of a metaphorical switch. With totally customizable hubs, HubSpot has thousands of apps that you can easily integrate, use, or get rid of whenever you need them or don't. Plus, transparent costs and an intuitive interface means there are no fancy frills to hide behind. That's because HubSpot isn't here to probably grow your business. It's here to help you grow your business, period. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. Trust me, I get it. Life is busy and starting or growing your email list is probably this daunting task that haunts you on your to-do list. So I have a question. Are you ready to finally start your email list like this week? Step up to my challenge today. Right now, it is your time. Join me for free as I walk you step-by-step on how to start and grow your email list. 
head to listbuildchallenge.com to join my totally free, super actionable zero to 250 challenge where I lead you for five days on the exact process of starting or growing an email list. Think 10 minute daily tutorials and teachings so that you can take action and get results fast. Now I started at zero two and I now pop into hundreds of thousands of inboxes every single week. That's major business impact and growth all with my mighty email list that started at literal ground zero. So here's my challenge for you. Join my absolutely free zero to 250 challenge and spend just five days with me growing your list that you can launch to. Start the free five-day challenge complete with video tutorials at listbuildchallenge.com. That's listbuildchallenge.com. Okay, so yeah, the whole mentorship. I wish I had someone like you to look to, especially if you're, you know, you're an entrepreneur or you're a young professional or changing careers or maybe getting back into the game, like whatever it is, if you're starting something new and you don't know where you are, like, I wish I had something like, like your podcast to listen to. And you have so many amazing topics, which after this, Jenna and I actually did a podcast a long time ago Mm -hmm. together. I'll put that in the show notes, but then I also want to put some of my favorite episodes of yours Mm -hmm. that would be really good and different and different topics that you've done. Jenna does like a lot of solos and, and I think it's so important for us to look to someone for advice. And it's mm-hmm. funny. I don't, I actually don't go, I don't have any men mentors. Well, my dad, Yeah, my dad, I go to my dad a lot, on a lot, a lot of things, but it's interesting though, even, you know, operating in a very like masculine world, like, yeah. like the marketing world is very masculine totally. and like the guys would always joke with me and be like, Oh, she's bringing the mom jeans to the party. And like, I was like, you better <laughs> believe I am or yoga pants, but it's, interesting because they see that like they need to like soften it up and they need to like so many of them market from a place of like run away from this like you know start a business and it'll like get you away from this life and I'm like no like show people the possibility and let them define it and it's like really beautiful the differences between approaches where I think we can learn from everyone. But I also think it takes a really great level of discernment of like, "Mm, yeah, that strategy does not sit well with me or that doesn't work for me. Yeah. Well, if you look at their customer base, it's probably different men. So I think a lot of things that you talk about too, women just don't talk about. Mm -hmm. We don't talk about financial Mm -hmm. stuff. On the plane, I was writing a episode about retirement and how to like save for retirement as an entrepreneur. And the guy next to me, I was like Googling, like, what is the average age of like an adult who retires in America? And it was 62. And I was like, okay, this guy next to me, I'm pretty sure is like at that age. And I was like, I wonder if he's like reading my notes. Cause I was like researching all this stuff about retirement and planning for it. And I was like, it's so fascinating. Cause like, I'm willing to like share everything about like, here's where I messed up. Here's what I did good. But it was just funny to me because I'm like, I hope he's like watching what I'm Googling and I like reflecting on his own <laughs> retirement decisions. I know. Oh my goodness. I can't even, I can't even wrap my head around that time, but my dad just retired. I know my parents were right on pace with yeah. that national average. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's still on the board of like all these things oh. and still has his laptop out uh, constantly, but he's <laughs> quote unquote retired. <laughs> He does play golf. (laughs) Okay. So your book, I want to go back to a couple of things about your book too, because it's interesting that you went into it more businessy and then Mm -hmm. took the business stuff out. So where Mm -hmm. is that? Where can we find, (laughs) where can we find? I know. Well, we were saying book number two will be a business book. I loved writing a book, which is so like, I have loved every part of the process. I loved editing it. Like I, yeah. Everything that people told me was like excruciating. I was like, bring it on. I don't know. I really loved it. But I'm reading some of the chapters that we cut on my podcast Mm -hmm. because they were so good. Mm -hmm. And we like removed them at the last minute on certain things. But I think what's super interesting too is that like my podcast is so business oriented and I love business and I love all of that. But especially as I see what entrepreneurship has afforded us as a family in terms of time. Yeah. I'm like, I want to teach people how to like have like live fat minutes, like just like minutes that are so rich that you can like close your eyes and come back to them all the time. And I just realize how fast time is going. And I don't want, because 
here, let's talk about this because we were just talking about it in the bathroom when we were getting ready. But mm-hmm. you were just saying about like how you like were on the grind for your 20s. Mm-hmm. And I mean, really, when you look at it, both of us were because like I'm 10 plus years into entrepreneurship. Like we, I started my company when I was 22. And it's so tricky because hustle is required at times, but it shouldn't become your go-to speed, right? Like there are seasons where you can hustle, but it shouldn't become like the autopilot. And I think we're living in a really interesting day and age, especially as women entrepreneurs, where there are two camps and it's just like toddlers where it's like, are you baby led weeding or are you pureeing? (laughs) But with women entrepreneurs, it's like, are you hustle culture or are you a manifester? And there's nothing in the middle. And my editor said, I chose your book and I believe in your book because it's like where the woo meets the work, where like the visions and the manifestations, you have those, but then you get up and you start taking like micro actions towards it. And I feel like we live in such a polarizing world as it is that when we can kind of figure out like, okay, how do I like hold visions and like, you know, make the Pinterest boards and like have those like ideas of my life. But then how do I like figure out like, what does it actually look like to implement, even if it's like microscopically small to like make progress? That's where I think the magic happens. And so when we look at the culture we live in and the way that women entrepreneurs are like grinding, 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 and then burning out and burning our bodies out. It's like, how do we help prevent the people that are 10 years behind us from doing it and doing it in a sustainable way so that when you hit 30, you're not like done. You know what I mean? You're just starting. Yeah. I love your approach to being an entrepreneur because it's more about freedom Mm -hmm. and it's not about success or any of those other things. Mm -hmm. So tell me about, tell me about a couple of things. So tell me about why you want to share with women, how you have built what you built Mm -hmm. and then encouraging them that they can build. And then also I want you to share the shield thing that you shared with me in the bathroom. We should have been recording. I know we should have been recording everything. (laughs) As we're like getting ready next to each other and I'm peeing and talking to Kat. I was in a recliner. Oh, it was great. <laughs> okay. So when I had Coco, so for our people that don't know, our fertility journey is similar to Kat's in that we, you know, it took us three years, two losses to have our first daughter. And I remember when I was going to have her, I blacked out the entire year after her birth, a full year. And I said, I'm saying no to everything. Oh, I thought you meant you like blacked out. Like, oh no, hitting, I remember the year. Song, every <laughs> <Yeah>. night. <laughs> Go on, girl. <laughs> so I literally took my entire calendar and I said, I am saying no to everything. Like wow. everything. I told my team, don't even let emails come to me. I don't even want to see opportunities. They might mm. feel shiny, but I'm saying no to everything. And I gave them like a templated response and just said, send this out. I don't even want to know. So... What was interesting to me is I worried so deeply. I was like, did I lose like my desire for success? Like I was around like other women who were like, I'm going to speak on all these stages. I'm going to make this much money. And I was like, I am going to birth the baby and like love her so well. And like, that was like my ambition. That's the place I'm in. Yes. And I felt like I was broken into this. No, I don't feel broken. (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) no, but I like felt like I was like, am I going to get my mojo back? Like my business mojo back? Like, and what I realized is, is like, I am an entrepreneur because I define success in a very different way. So there's like lifestyle entrepreneurs and then there's like accolade success based entrepreneurs. And I'm like, I am a lifestyle entrepreneur. I want to earn enough to like live the type of life that I want to live. And I don't need more than that. And I'm good. And when I realized that it like took the pressure off of like, I was like, one upping myself or like, you know, year over year revenue or like things like that. Like my years that I'm pregnant are my worst revenue years because I'm like growing a human. (laughs) And I recently told one of my friends who's pregnant, I was like, just so you know, I I was like, this might be totally out of line, but like, if you're looking at numbers and you're like wondering what's going on, like you're growing a human plus you're preparing content so you can take an actual leave, like let the numbers go, like get back to life. So that was like why I love teaching women, like, how do you define success? And like, for us in this season, it's like putting my kids to bed, being there in the morning, 
anytime they want to take a walk in the middle of the day saying yes. Like it's like these really random things that I'm like, this is success. Like Saturday morning pancakes, like, you know, and so it's like, I could never, you know, you're not going to read about those in like an entrepreneur magazine, but like that to me is like what matters. And I want women to start redefining success in their own terms and not having to explain it to anyone, like just relishing in them living it and like letting that be enough. I love that so much. It's going to be so good for you. Save it for the teaser. (laughs) (laughs) Notes. I think redefining what success looks like is so important because yeah, I think I was so in hustle culture because Mm -hmm. I didn't see a way out of it. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I built something that I, there was no, there was no way that I could have a boundary with that. I was just like, okay, I I built this thing, but how am I supposed to have a baby? And that's why I kept waiting. I was like, I can't be a mom if I have this other thing that I, that needs me. And then now I'm like, oh, actually like, I'm a better entrepreneur as a mother. Same. hundred percent. And I never used to have boundaries at all. And then now I am so protective of my family, my time spent. And I think that that's something that when I speak openly about it, everyone feels the same. Everybody feels the same way. Mm -hmm. It's like we're all experiencing all these different things, but all women need really healthy boundaries so we can make those pancakes on a Saturday morning mm-hmm. and not be checking emails and mm-hmm. things like that. Tell me about that shield. Oh yeah. That, yeah. I was telling really Kat good. that before I had my daughter, you know, after our journey, and I know you've experienced this as well in this pregnancy specifically, but like, I just was like going very inward. Like even when I was in labor and in pain, like I go very inward. I just get quiet. I don't want anyone to touch me. I'm just like processing things. I was just staring at the Hollywood sign going, where am I? <laughs> And and someone had sent me this message and it was like, it was just this really sweet message. And it was like, I was praying for you this morning. And I just pictured this like white light around you surrounding you. But I also pictured you in armor, like you were protecting yourself and you were like just dressing yourself in armor. Mm -hmm. And I loved that because I think, you know, going through motherhood and, you know, dealing with all of the like dichotomy of like grief and happiness when you finally get to meet like a double rainbow baby and like all those feelings. And I often just have that vision for myself of like dressing in armor and like just living out my truth and like whatever that is. And then also not overthinking it to the point where I'm like second guessing myself constantly because I'm Mm. in that right now and it's exhausting, right? Like when I'm like, Mm. should I have gone? Should I have stayed home? Should I have said no? Should I have done this? Is this the wrong time? Like, it's like, that's exhausting. And so many of us live on a loop like that. And so it's like when I actually think about like, I'm clothing myself in armor. I'm like wearing my identity with pride. I'm like protecting myself in like white light or whatever you want to visualize. But like, I'm just spreading out the goodness that like just brings me peace because it's like, we don't have boundaries. And like nowadays people have a direct line into us. They can reach us at any point. They can comment, they could DM, they could do anything. And it's so easy to impact our energy and our energy is like everything. And like, when we want to give our energy to our children, the fact that we could let like a stranger on the internet take that is so hard and sad. Why do people even have to comment about other people on the internet? (laughs) Can we cancel that right now? Age old question. We're going to do that right now. We're going to just, just manifest that. (laughs) Speaking of manifesting things, no more talking about people that you don't know. know. Isn't that wild? (laughs) Although then you get like the nicest comments and you're like, Oh, I love this. And then like the next one, we're going to manifest the negative. Yeah. (laughs) I got to (laughs) specify. Yeah. I think that you have taught me so much about just making sure that things don't overlap too much. Mm -hmm. Integrating with boundaries. Yeah. Yeah. And having different parts of your life that can be sacred for your family. Yes. Oh my gosh. You and I were also talking about that in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) I mean, we should just do a series of like bathroom talk with (laughs) Kat and Jenna. You know, it's interesting because I think we're, one of my biggest takeaways about why the pandemic was so challenging for people is that for a long time, people were compartmentalizing their lives. So they were like one person at work, 
one person at home, one type of mom, one type of partner, one type of caregiver, one type of worker bee. And then all of a sudden, like if you are fortunate enough to work from home, you're doing everything under one roof. So you yeah. cannot have all these separate identities. You've got to figure out how to blend it. Right. It's like not about the balance. It's like the blend. And a lot of people were faced with like, who am I like actually? And like, if I just show up as myself in all of the forms, like as a mom, as a business person, as a wife, as a partner, you know, like, how do I even do that? And it's almost like we like put ourselves into these little Tupperware and like, I'm going to pull out this version. And I think that can be helpful at times. But I also think that like, in order to be a good friend to other people, you have to know who you wholly are because like our friendship, we in an hour, we could talk about business, motherhood, boundaries, relationships, you know, everything. Mm -hmm. And we show up as our whole selves mm -hmm. and it totally changes the relationship. It's like how the conversation changes when you go from how are you to how are you really? Mm -hmm. So it is interesting. And I do, we talk about boundaries a lot, you and I, because it's something that we're constantly like the fine dance of like, what does that even look like? And like, some days are good. Some days are hard. But like, where do you draw the line? And like, I didn't, I never wanted to write a book because I thought I'd have to tell all of my stories in it. Mm -hmm. And I just realized like, I have to tell the right stories. And like, there's yeah. still things in my life that are just for me or just for my family. And like, I kind of love that. You know, I love that too. Yeah. What are some of the greatest lessons that come out of your book that someone mm -hmm. can like really look forward to yeah in your in your mind because I know that everyone's gonna obviously yeah. come out with a different lesson isn't that so cool it's that crazy you, people read your book completely differently I know and interpret it based on their brain I know oh. it's been crazy because <laughs> I like really held it very close to my heart and so now that it's out in the world and like people are like sending me like their favorite quotes or like, oh my gosh, this chapter reminded me, I'm like, <gasps> like where it's like, wow. I feel like I'm naked on a stage, yeah. like where it is crazy. Cause it's like, I just like really got into my own, like I went very inward when I wrote it. And now it's like, oh my gosh, and even Drew like has been reading it. He didn't read it when I wrote it. Cause I was just like, and anything that included him, I had him read it. Cause I just wanted him to feel comfortable with what I was sharing. But like, it wasn't like a collaborative thing. It was just like, is this okay? Anyone that I included in the book, I let them read that, but that was it. And so now that the book is out, I think the biggest lessons that I would say are first, like when is last time you got quiet with yourself? And like, when is the last time that you honestly answered the question, how am I really? And it's okay if it's not okay. Mm -hmm. But like, when was the last time that I like didn't bring my cell phone with when I peed or like things like that? Like we are mm -hmm. so bad at being quiet with ourselves because it's scary. Mm -hmm. The second thing would just be like, how can I show up for myself wholly, but how can I start to like enter relationships from like a more whole perspective of like not hiding the parts of me or my desires or my losses or like, how can I show up? And it's going to look different for everyone but your relationships totally change. Like our relationship is what it is because we show up the way we do. And then the last one is how can you prove to yourself that you are capable of making progress? I think so many of us beat ourselves up because we have these ideas or visions or things we want to do. And it's almost like our goals become like our failures that are like poking at us every day, telling us we're not worthy or I knew you couldn't do that or you were never going to take action. And I think so many of us are walking around feeling like this guilt and shame when really we should be liberated by our ideas and inspired by our progress. And so how can we as humans like welcome and understand that like slow growth is still growth? And that we are capable, like how can we trust in ourselves to follow through even in the tiniest ways? Because I know for me, for so long, I've like lived with like guilt of like health or things like that. Like I thought I'd be in better shape or I thought I lose a baby weight or I do all these things. And it's like, now that I'm just taking these tiny actions every day, like I trust myself to do it and it'll do it in its own time. And so mm -hmm. that's what I want people to learn. I really love how you live different seasons of your life unapologetically where it is what it is. Mm -hmm. You it's get it. So you get, cool. <laughs> you just get me. 
That I mean, that's so special. Yeah. Because a lot of people would apologize for that. Mm -hmm. And there's so many different seasons. Mm -hmm. There's a season for, like you're saying, being on a stage and being naked on a stage. (laughs) When you said I felt naked on stage, I actually pictured you naked on stage. I'm like, that's fun. (laughs) You actually probably could picture that more than anyone else. (laughs) Good. I mean, I saw you naked this morning. (laughs) But yeah, I I think that that's something that we need to embrace more as women Mm -hmm. is that all the different seasons and there's a season for success of those pancakes in the morning and going on those walks. And then there's the season of what you want to do, maybe more in your career Mm -hmm. or whatever that is. Yeah. I have so many friends, you know, they, they took a lot of time speaking of that, like four years, five years with their kids. And if they had multiple kids, they took like eight years of their life to be like, I'm going to be a full-time mom. I'm going to be a really Mm -hmm. kick-ass full-time mom. And then maybe I'm going to revisit a career later. Yes. And those women, they're listening to your podcast and they're discovering Andrews. photography and <laughs> thanks. But they're, you know, I think that that's really cool because they mm. totally embrace that season. Yes. And that's something that I was not ready for mm-hmm. that I, I don't regret. Obviously, like we have our daughter and we have our story now, but why wasn't I willing to have that season earlier? Mm-hmm. Why? Yeah. Well, what, what was it in me that was like I think so it, scared and unprepared? And you tell me I could be <laughs> so off base, but I in talking with women, I feel like there's this theme that we are so afraid to hit the brake pedal because we worry about losing momentum mm. or people calling us a fraud or recognizing that any success that we've seen in our life was just like a big break or like luck. And so we trick ourselves that like, I'm just going to keep going, like strike while the iron's hot. Well, the iron's hot because you made it hot and we forget that. So it's like, we keep going on the hamster wheel, telling ourselves like, I'll slow down when, or I'll start my family when, or I'll be present when. And we convince ourselves that like, we're going to lose momentum if we slow down. And I think that I have fully embraced this belief of like, I can hit the brake pedal and still know where the gas pedal is. And I trust myself. So like, I am actually not afraid to like earn way less money, to slow down, to not do launches, to like do all, like, I'm not afraid of that at all because I trust myself that like when I am ready again, Mm -hmm. I will hit that gas pedal and you will not know what hit you. But like, truly, I think that so many women are like believing, like we were walking around feeling like frauds or like wondering, like, if I slow down, am I going to become irrelevant? Are people going to forget about me? is the next version of me coming up and like, they're going to pass me by. And it's like, that's not for you. Yeah. Like, you know, it's just different, but isn't it funny? Cause like I waited to have kids because one, I didn't want them at first, which is really interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, I tell that story, but two, because I was worried that it would change my opportunities and I was at the peak of my career and what is this going to do? And you know, it's crazy. I love this description in your book. It's about taking a moment to soak up the richness of our experiences and creating a life that makes room for more actual living. Mm -hmm. So that I had goosebumps. I was like, this is where we're aligned. Live beautifully. Yes. It's about living beautifully because for years for me, I didn't know why I was working so hard. And actually now it's to live beautifully. I'd love to hear what live beautifully means to you and how you live beautifully. Yeah. I know how you live beautifully. (laughs) <laughs> but I, I love oh, for everyone. This else is why I you. love your brand, but not just your brand, your mission, because mm-hmm. you, you live it in every corner of your being, like not just the corners of your house or the space, but like your being is that living beautifully to me means like living this enriched life. And when I say enriched, I mean like rich with the right things, like so rich that you taste it, you feel it, like you are awake to the life you're living And I feel like so many times like people will be like, oh, I look back and I wish I would have been, I wish I would have been, or like, you know, you know how, when you look at a picture of yourself, like five years ago and you're like, if that girl would have known how great she is, (laughs) she would, you know, like, and it's like funny because we're like not awake to the lives that are happening and we're like waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And so living beautifully means having these fat minutes where we are just so present and alive and vibrant And we're awake to what's happening in front of us. And whenever we make pancakes on a Saturday morning, I had this vision before we had Coco of this long table and pancakes and music and this little girl giggling. And that vision was like what I held on to throughout like the dark days. But Drew will look at me whenever we make pancakes on Saturdays and I'll like just be like teary because I'm like awake to that. Like this 
you know, that quote, like the things you're living are the things you once prayed for. Like when you're awake to that reality, that's living beautifully. It's so important for us to slow down in those Mm -hmm. moments. When you just said, when I look at that girl five years ago, when I look at myself five years ago, and I mean, our phones remind us of so many things. I just want to be like, slow the F down. Yeah. Slow the F down Mm -hmm. and just be, and just Mm -hmm. like have dinner with Brian. Mm -hmm. (laughs) For real. The things you would do. Yeah. You would do. I know. I, I love this so much. Okay. For someone who is at home, that's never met you before. Mm -hmm. I want you to share just a message for her to lift her up today. I mean, you do this so naturally, Mm -hmm. even just in your voice notes to me, it's like so, so nice, but what can you tell her just about living, living beautifully? And what is your wish for her Mm -hmm. to move forward from this moment, the rest of her life? Yeah. If you're listening to this, I sincerely just hope that you learn how to lean into your life the good parts, the hard parts, the happy parts, the sad parts, because what you're feeling is meant to be felt. And there's something that I learned because I think we all carry grief with us. I know you and I have walked our own journeys, but there's this line in the book that I love so much. And it's, you're not meant to move on from your grief. You're meant to learn how to carry it with you. And I feel like I like picture like a turtle with a shell on its back of like, we're getting stronger because we're carrying this grief, but the grief for me was a great teacher. And I think a lot of us are grieving things in our lives, whether it's relationships or changes in our identity or, you know, unfinished dreams or unmet expectations. And when we can learn how to walk forward and carry that with us so that we can be changed people. When I think about our friendship, like we have totally evolved over the last three and a half years as friends, but as individuals. And I think a lot of that comes from learning how to carry what we've experienced, but also continue to move forward. So don't give up, stay on the path, feel those feelings, keep moving forward. And the goal is not to look outside for answers. The goal is to learn how to look within. And that's what I really hope. I hope that when somebody asks you, how are you really? And you feel safe enough to answer that the answer is like unapologetically good. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming. Mm. I love you. I love you too. Okay. Where can everyone get your book, find you and do all the things? You can head to howareyoureallybook.com. Everything is under Jenna Kutcher, spelled like Ashton. No relation, unfortunately. (laughs) Although my husband could like look like his cousin or something. Totally. And Instagram is Jenna Kutcher. And I really just hope that at the heart of this, like at the end of this two year long project of writing and releasing a book into the world, all I want is for it to make a difference so that people can come back home to themselves. And that's like Mm -hmm. the greatest gift that someone could give me is just reading those pages and not just listening to me, but like learning how to listen to themselves again. Coming back home to yourself. Mm-hmm. Oh, like <laughs> I want to cry. So hormones. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I had to come home. Yeah. Your I, body has been waiting for you too. Yeah. And to trust it. I wasn't home for a long mm-hmm. time, but now I'm home mm-hmm. and now you're in my home. It's the best. I love you being here. I love you too. <laughs> okay, love you. I'm going to cry. Aww. <laughs> Thanks for joining everyone. <laughs> Thank you guys. Until next time. Till next live time. Live beautifully. <laughs> Can I just say that this is one of those conversations that feels like it ends too soon? That is the bittersweet beauty of a great conversation that deserves a chapter two, three, or even more. I hope you enjoyed this glorious detour on over to Katrina's podcast, Live Beautifully, and that you feel empowered to do exactly that this week. I'm grateful that I could share this episode with you and maybe even introduce you to a new friend, Kat. Listen and subscribe to Live Beautifully with Katrina Scott wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, until next time, keep on digging your biggest goals. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because you just finished another episode of the Gold Digger podcast. Did that go by way too fast for anyone else? If you want more, head over to golddiggerpodcast.com for show notes and all the discount codes from today's sponsors. And if you're looking for a new crew of movers and shakers like you to bounce ideas and ask questions, be sure to join my exclusive community for gold diggers on Facebook. The link's waiting for you at golddiggerpodcast.com. 